Well, good morning, Walden Community Church. Uh, this morning, I thought I would start with a verse. So this is Luke chapter 5, verse 26. And it says, Amazement seized them all, and they glorified God, and were filled with awe, saying, We have seen extraordinary things today. Did you come to church expecting to see something extraordinary? Probably not. I mean, coming to church can be like going to the grocery store. You pretty much know what to expect. Isn't that sad? I mean, this is God's house. We should be experiencing something biblical. We should be having a God moment, right? And certainly experience something extraordinary. Today, right? As the verse suggests. I mean, don't get me wrong. I think we all hope that wonderful things will happen. We do expect extraordinary things to happen, but usually when we expect those things, they're out there in the future. One day, my kids will go to college, right? One day, my kids will move out. One day, my kids will get married. Or how about one day when I meet that special someone? One day when I get married, right? Or one day when I get that raise. Or one day when I get that promotion. One day when I get to retire. But did you notice that in the passage we just read from the book of Luke, it says, today, right? Today. How about, how about now? How about today? What extraordinary thing is going to happen today? Today is a powerful word in the Bible. I mean, not, expect, just look in the book of Luke. Just in the book of Luke. Look at these verses. And Jesus began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Luke 19.5, And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry, you can come down, for I must stay at your house today. Luke 19.9, Jesus said, Today salvation has come to this house, since he is also a son of Abraham. Luke 23, And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. I mean, don't you ever wish that you could have seen Jesus? I do. I mean, heard him teach that would have been extraordinary. That would have been a day unlike any other day. Or, or to see him perform a miracle. I think some of those lucky few that got to see him perform a miracle, they would have left with awe and wonder. And more than likely, that morning, they didn't just wake up thinking, oh, today is going to be extraordinary. James Dean says, dream as if you'll live forever. Live as if you'll die today. Because you see all those hopes, those expectations that I listed earlier, that's, that's, the, that's the future, right? Your kids get married, you retire, winning the lottery. That's all life that's out in front of you. But the reality is none of that life is guaranteed. The only day that is guaranteed is today. And we might hope, certainly, that God moves in our lives tomorrow. We might hope that God does wonders and miracles in our lives tomorrow. But what about today? Don't we believe that God can show up today? Of course. Second Peter 1 Peter 1.3 says, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. And you have that power, right? Of course you do. And it's available to you. When? Today, right? Philippians 4.13, very popular verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Tomorrow? No, not tomorrow, today. Yeah, but after I get my life together. No, right now, today. Don't you believe that God can use you today? Teach you something today. Love you today. Change your life today. Of course. So live 
with that divine expectation today. Tell me something. Would you like a nice big bowl of ice cream? When? When would you like that? Right now. Right? <laughs> right now, sure. Would you like a million dollars? Of course. When, what's a good time for you? Uh, right now is a good time for me, right? Today, today. Okay, so let's expect God to do something extraordinary in our life today. I mean, you're in, you're in church right now. This is the Sabbath day. Shouldn't we feel the presence of God right now? And, but, and the rest of the week as well right? It's, it shouldn't just be on, on Sunday. We should feel God's presence on Monday. We should feel God's presence on Tuesday. We should feel God's presence on Thursday. When was the last time you felt close to God? I mean, just think. How, how far away was it? When was the last time you received a word from God? Jesus said once, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. That's what I'm afraid of. That as Christians, we can be so close to God, but then on the other hand, be so far away. Always living in the hope of this future, but being blind to what's happening today. I think we can miss Jesus. Yeah, we can miss it. And we'll talk more about that in a couple weeks. But I think we can, we can do church. We can worship on a Sunday. We can act Christian all week long. And all of that just becomes a routine. We're going through the motions. Isaiah 29 says, Behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people, with wonder upon wonder, and the wisdom of the wise men shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. I want to experience that. I want to experience these wonderful things from God. Wonder upon wonder, wisdom, discernment. And I believe that if, if God feels far away, I want you to believe that even now, God wants you to experience that wonder today. In Matthew 14, the Bible tells us that John the Baptist was beheaded. And so Jesus and his disciples, they pull away in a boat to retreat, to have some alone time, but it doesn't work. And a crowd begins to form on the shore. And so Jesus rows the boat back to shore and he begins to teach them and heal them and counsel them and love them. And, and it's not just for a couple of hours. The Bible says it goes all day long. And, but, you know, by the end, and it's starting to be dusk, people are starting to get a little peckish, they're getting a little hungry, and Jesus, uh, you know, looks around and, to his disciples and says, you know, these people need food. Matthew 14 says, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself, but when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. Now, when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. Jesus says, these people need food. All right, everybody, check your pockets. <laughs> what do you got on you? So the disciples, they go out into the crowd, and they find some food. And they come back to him and they say, here we have five loaves and two fish. Very meager pickings, right? That's, that's not a lot of food. That is not enough. And Jesus said, bring them here to me. And he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said, to said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. Notice the order. He breaks the bread. He blesses the bread. He gives the bread. He breaks the bread. He blesses the bread. He gives the bread. Same 
order of things that he does at the Last Supper, right? And then what happens? A miracle. The Bible says they all ate, they were satisfied, they took up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces left over, and those who ate were about 5,000 men beside women and children. Wow, 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 wow. Extraordinary day, right? Amazing day. Plus a repeat miracle. Well, if you think about it, I mean, you think about the miracle from Exodus when people were wandering in the desert and they had no food and they were hungry and they looked to God and God said, I will send down bread from heaven to satisfy you. And so the manna came down and it was miraculous bread. So this is kind of like that. It's kind of a, a remembrance of that, you know, God providing food. But it's also this foreshadowing, this looking forward to the, to the book of Revelation where we know that we will all sit around the great banquet table and we will all have a meal. We will all share a meal at the great wedding feast with God. So that makes this story so important because it's the exact middle between those two great events. And it's the only miracle that appears in all four Gospels. Why do you think that is? Because this miracle points to Jesus. And it affirms. It says this this guy is the Son of God. Manna comes down from heaven, and Jesus, remember, Jesus said once, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Wow, 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 wow. Extraordinary day, right? Days like this do not come around that often. Anyone who was there, who was lucky to have seen this miracle, incredible. And yet, the Bible records that when the disciples got back into the boat, he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. They were completely amazed for the disciples did not understand about the loaves and their hearts were hardened. The disciples did not understand about the loaves. How could that be? How could they have missed it? They were there. They're his disciples. They're with Jesus. How did they miss this moment? We'll talk about that some more in a couple of weeks. But let's keep reading. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side when he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Now, this is a great story when we talk about the storms of life, the trials of life. And maybe this fits, like you've you could, you could identify, you could say, you know what, I've, I've been in a storm like this. My, my life was not going forward. My life was not going backwards. I was stuck. I, I wasn't making any progress. I couldn't see a way out. And all of a sudden, Jesus shows up to save. But the disciples don't recognize him. How is that possible? Well, sometimes... I think we don't see things if we're not expecting them. You wouldn't expect Jesus to be out there walking on the water. I think sometimes when we're looking forward to the future, we're looking forward out there to the, the distant future, we're looking for something that maybe isn't even coming. And we forget that we don't have to look out there, that Jesus is right here. Jesus is right in the boat with us, right? He's healing us every day. He's counseling us every day. He's providing bread from heaven for us every day. And he wants to reveal himself to us today. They don't recognize him out there on the water and Jesus reassures them. He says, it is I, right? It is I also. Doesn't that sound, again, like 
Moses, mountaintop, burning bush language, right? And if you, if you take the words in the story, if you take the Greek words in the story, and you count all the words that come up to it is I, and then you count all the words that come after it is I, both sides have equal weight. There's 90 words in front and behind the statement, which means all the surrounding text becomes this pointing, flashing, yellow, bright, glowing neon arrow that points at this phrase, it is I, pointing at Jesus. Jesus wants to meet us in our storms today. Jesus wants to walk out across the water and fix our problems today. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come, out, come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. You know what's funny about this? What, is, what does Peter's name mean? Rock? Why would, why would, be, <laughs> why would we be surprised that a rock would sink? <laughs> Verse 31, Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him saying to him, Oh, you a little faith, why did you doubt? And then when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. You know, can we just stop blaming Peter for taking his eyes off of Jesus? Can we stop looking at this story as a failure story for just a moment and appreciate the fact that Peter took more steps on water than you or I ever will. I don't think the question is, why did Peter take his eyes off Jesus? I think the question is, how come nobody else got out of the boat? Why was it just Peter? You know, in, in the relationship between rabbi and disciple, the rabbi always sets the bar. The rabbi sets the example. And as the student, in, in, any, in any mentor, student, teacher, student relationship, the idea is always the teacher is an obtainable goal. Their knowledge is obtainable. The things that they're doing, you can do. I'm gonna teach you how to play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, and you can do it too, right? I'm gonna teach you that two plus two equals four, and you can learn that too. So the idea is, as a rabbi, I want my students to do the things that I do. And if you saw your rabbi doing something, you would try to do it today. And so here in our story, a rabbi calls out to his disciple and Peter responds and he says, I wanna do that. And instead of asking, why did Peter sink? I think a better question is, how come Peter is the only disciple who follows? How come only Peter tries? How come only Peter obeys in this moment? Peter had a divine expectation about today, didn't he? He didn't say, one day I'll be able to walk on water too. He's like, nope, I'm doing this today. <laughs> Let's stop believing that life gets better tomorrow. Let's stop believing that life happens tomorrow or that things will get better tomorrow or that God will build this church tomorrow or God will grow this church tomorrow or God will advance his kingdom tomorrow. Let's start looking at Jesus and the work that Jesus is doing today. God took an event where people were just hungry People get hungry all the time. It's not new. People get hungry three times a day, every day. God took a moment and he used bread and he used fish to create a miracle that pointed to his son as the Messiah. If God can do that, God can do extraordinary things through you today. Isn't that exciting? We read Luke 526, amazement seized them all, and they glorified God, and they were filled with awe, saying, we have seen extraordinary things 
today. You're going to leave this place. You're going to stop watching this video. You're going to go back out and you're going to be around other people and they're going to say, what happened at church today? What was the sermon about today? Wouldn't you love to come back and say, extraordinary things. Oh, extraordinary things happened at church today. Or better yet, next week. Next week, when you come back to church and people say, how was your week? What did you do this week? What do we always talk about? We talk about our health, right? How I felt, what's going on with my body, my hips, my legs. We talk about our lawn. Oh, I was out doing yard work, gardening, right? I was doing that. We talk about the weather. Oh man, that rain, how much? Oh, I got three inches of rain at my house. Wouldn't it be so great instead that when we came back next week, we talked about all the extraordinary things that God was doing, all the ways we saw God move, all the ways God used us and how we got to be a part of it. Let's live in today. Let's live with divine expectations that God will use us and move with us and heal us, feed us, love us today. Let's pray. Lord, we know that you are in this moment. You are here with us right now, but not because it's church and not because it's a sermon time and not because it's the Sabbath. You were with us because that was the promise that you would never leave us, that you would never forsake us, and that you are always with us. Lord, help us to be mindful of your presence. Even in the mundane things, taking out the trash, doing the dishes, taking the kids to school, Lord, you are in all of those moments you are in my moments. You are in my breath. Lord, may I be aware of your presence. May I see you and not miss those moments. Help me to take my eyes off of tomorrow and to focus on the path today, to walk with you today, to be your disciple today to know that I can do great things with you, extraordinary things, that I can witness miracles, that I can turn the world upside down with you today. Thank you for being my Lord and my God and my King today. Thank you for being my merciful teacher today. Thank you for being my wonderful counselor today. Today is all I have. And so I give you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for joining us. Thanks for hanging out with us. Of course, today at church, uh, it was Youth Sunday, and our youth came, and they uh, had a whole presentation about uh, what they do, just trying to raise awareness for uh, our group, and we're so proud of our, our youth group and our youth leaders and all our volunteers. We love them so much, and I, we just want to let you know that we have a youth group. We have a youth group every Wednesday. Uh, the kids meet here at Walden Community Church, in Montgomery, Texas, and we're uh, open every Wednesday at six o'clock. So if you live close, you live in the neighborhood, please send your, your kids sixth grade, sixth grade and up, uh, for you know about an hour and a half. We'll even feed them dinner. We'll feed them dinner, we'll send them home to you. Uh, they're gonna have a fun time of fellowship, games, and of course, they'll learn a little bit more about Jesus and their Christian walk. We'd love to see them, we'd love to have them through the summer. Don't forget, we also have Vacation Bible School coming up. So you want to make sure that you get kids registered for that because we have a very limited space, but we're so excited to have VBS back as well. Thanks for watching, guys. I will see you guys next week.